Yeah, it's nice to be back in Churchill, actually. It's, uh, it, 1963 is when I came here. Um, this is the kind of stuff, this is an example of the sort of things that um, I'm working on at the moment. And this is joint work with um, a couple of American friends. Martin Golubitsky runs the Mathematical Biosciences Institute in Columbus, Ohio. And he was the driving force behind this particular piece of work. And one of his postdocs, Casey Dinkman, did a lot of the work too. Some of what I'm going to talk about is, in fact, their work, not mine. Some of it's mine in conjunction with them. So, uh, but I'm not going to make too much fuss about which is which, because it's all part of the same thing. So we're interested in modeling, in some simple sense, how the brain takes decisions about what, in this case, what it's seeing. There's a more general context, which is just how it takes decisions about when it has conflicting information. Um, but the visual illusions are a particularly clean experimental setup. So you will have seen these. Now, the dancer here, the illusion, and it, it, it usually works if you stare at her for long enough. She seems to be spinning in one particular direction. But if you keep looking, suddenly she'll appear to switch. It can take 20 or 30 seconds. Once, um, once you've seen it, it seems to start happening more frequently to some extent. But every so often, she flips direction. doesn't work for everybody. You may have to be the right distance away from it. Look up Spinning Dancer on the web if you're not getting it. Um, over on the other side of the screen is, is a, a fairly old, very famous illusion, which is the duck and rabbit. It's, it's not a very good duck, and it's not a very good rabbit. <laughs> but if you look at it and think, oh, that's a rabbit, you can sort of convince yourself it is. And then, then the brain seems to say, hang on, it might be a duck. And then you see it facing the other way. So if the stuff on the left is the beak, it's a duck. And that means that the head is facing that way. And if you think the stuff on the left is the ears, that means the head is facing the other way. Yep. So, duck rabbit, spinning dancer, the most famous of all, neck a cube. It's a skeleton of a cube. And if you look at it, it seems to flip between pointing out in one direction or pointing in the other direction. The uh, bottom right face of the cube can be in front or it can be at the back. And the brain seems to flip between seeing those two objects, two versions of it. What it's very hard to see is what it actually is, which is a collection of 12 straight lines in a plane. <laughs> so we are so used to interpreting images like that as three-dimensional objects that somewhere in the brain, that's what it wants to see. Okay, so with illusions, both eyes see the same image from slightly different angles. But that image is ambiguous. There's more than one interpretation. And what is observed and what people experiment on is the switch in interpretation. And they'll get experimental subjects to keep pushing buttons every time it flips. And then they look at the timings and things like that. OK? So Necker cube, is that the front face? Or is that the front face? Yeah, if I exaggerate it, you see the two possibilities. Another famous illusion, my wife and my mother-in-law. Um, it's a bit sexist, but um, there's a very attractive young lady who is the wife, who is facing away from us. And you can just see her nose pointing out on the left-hand side. Um, if I can, yeah, let's get. That's her nose. That's her chin. OK? Now, to see the mother-in-law, that is the mother-in-law's mouth, rather than a choker worn by the young lady. This is mother-in-law's chin. That's mother-in-law's nose. These are the two eyes. So you see, and she's facing the other way. And it's a, <coughs> a bigger head. So, wife and mother-in-law, rabbit and duck, cat and mouse. 
I love this one. Is it a cat? Is it a mouse? <laughs> it's a bit of both. Is that a man playing a saxophone or a woman's face? That's a clever one. Now, there are some other <coughs> slightly different kinds of illusion. The impossible elephant. OK, look at his feet. The feet and the legs don't actually meet. OK? So locally, the picture makes sense, but globally, when you fit it together, it doesn't. And there are many of those. Um, this one, again, sometimes works when I do it. Those circles can seem to move like this. And if you look this one up on the web and get it the right distance from the screen, you actually see these circles slightly moving. And then there's Fraser's spiral, this beautiful pattern of spirals, except they're actually circles. Yeah, they really are circles. But they're circles drawn with this pattern which makes the eye perceive things spiralling in. And a thing called the stoner plaid illusion. <laughs> is that diamonds moving vertically or is it two sets of lines going through each other? Yeah? Um, as I'm looking at it at the moment, it's just switched actually. It was diamonds, but now it's two sets of lines. And then it goes back to being diamonds again. And it, it keeps flipping. The perception keeps flipping. Okay. So, what I want to talk about is none of those, to begin with, <laughs> but yet another type of illusion, which is called rivalry, often called binocular rivalry. So the idea is that each eye gets a different picture. You set it up so that this is the case. You can actually do a little piece of cardboard between and stick two pictures in front of you, uh, but there are better experimental setups. And these two images conflict. They're different. And you ask people what they say, and the simplest thing that happens is they, see, they say they're seeing one of these images, and then it's as if their attention switches to the other one. And then they see the other image. OK? So um, there are two experiments here. The one on the left is very typical of what's done in the subject. Colours and grids are very common because they're very simple things. You have to balance the colours so that one doesn't dominate. So in this experiment, they showed subjects a vertical pink and grey grid and a horizontal green and grey grid. Okay? And there's another experiment, which I'll come back to in a moment, which has... It's basically a picture of a monkey and some picture of some text, green, blue on green. <coughs> but the pictures have been chopped up like little jigsaw puzzles, and three of the pieces have been swapped between them. So you can see three bits of monkey on the left and the other three bits on the right. And the same with the text. Okay, so this is the monkey text experiment. I think it's an ape, actually, but it's always <coughs> called monkey text. Okay, so let's start with <coughs> the grids. Okay. When they did the experiments on this, they got a surprise. These are the two images shown to the two eyes, left eye, right eye. This is what people perceived. Some people saw the original two images and flipping between them. Some people flipped between the other two images, which are green and pink horizontal stripes and green and pink vertical stripes. Which is quite interesting because the, the eyes between them have seen green, they've seen pink, they've seen horizontal, they've seen vertical. But in these subjects, those bits and pieces are getting reassembled the wrong way. The brain is somehow failing to match the colours and the directions correctly. And it, it's fooled into doing this because of this conflicting information. Uh, so this is called colour misbinding in the literature. So th the idea is that visual perception, the, um, the eye receives signals, they go down through the visual cortex layer by layer, various processes go on, and they're kind of pulled apart into all the components. 
But then somewhere else, those are reassembled, but the brain now knows what all the bits are, and that's the binding point. So something perceives the colour, something perceives the direction, something later on puts colour and direction back together, um, which you have to do because now you know what colour and what direction, which from the image alone is um, not information the brain has got as such. But sometimes it gets put back together wrong. This is also the case with monkey text. Most people, e even though this is set up so that you, you, you know there's a picture of a monkey and a picture of text underlying it, most people just see it flipping between the two mixed images. They'll say, oh, it's, it's got text at the left-hand corner and bits of monkey. Oh, no, it's got monkey at the top left-hand corner and bits of text. And they flip between them like that. But some people put the pictures together. Oh, I'm seeing the entire monkey. Not a very pretty monkey, but I'm seeing the entire monkey or I'm seeing the entire text. And Marty, in his habitual manner, was sitting in a lecture somebody was giving about all of this and thought, those two experiments are exactly the same. The, the, these are isomorphic, mathematically. These, these, the same phenomenon is going on here. Yeah? Uh, in some sense, in the abstract, you're looking at two copies of the same <coughs> experiment with the same effects. So could we model that? Could we set up some models, compare with observations, make some predictions, see what happens, do a bit of science... Ah, but that, well, that's true, but I'll show you with the sense in which they are. The, the model underlying them is the same in both cases. It's the interpretation that's different. Okay? If you split it into what colours am I seeing, what orientation grids am I seeing, green and vertical is in two pieces. It's green, you're seeing green or pink in various places or combinations of green and pink. You're seeing vertical or horizontal. So the way you dissect the images is into these two distinct components. So when you reassemble them, if, it, if the colours you're seeing are green and pink and the stripes you're seeing are horizontal, then you have got green and pink horizontal. Okay? But I'm not saying it's green horizontal plus pink horizontal. I'm saying colours green, or green and pink, stripes horizontal and then the brain assigns the colours to the stripes. That makes sense? Thing yeah. Thing. Uh, I've noticed that, um, you know much better, that when you look at red, it lags, and when you look at, say, green, it's much quicker, because it's where, the, you know, where you're detecting these things. It's sort of, now, does that come into the play here? The experimentalists have to be extraordinarily careful to set up the colours to avoid that kind of effect. I mean, the other thing, it's not just quicker, the point of the, the b w red stands out in a way that green doesn't to us. If you've got a, a red splodge, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Marilyn Monroe over there, and the red is absolutely standing out. And if it was a pale green, it probably wouldn't. Yeah, and there are all sorts of reasons why red is important to us. Um, but they do the experiments that they kind of, um, what sort of, they calibrate the perception on the individual so that the, those two colours are perceived in a kind of equal way. Yeah. So, now you have to be very, very careful with this stuff. You can do these anecdotal experiments, um, but the, the real experiments, all of those issues do have to be addressed. That's absolutely correct. So, the, the idea is abstract this whole thing a little into a decision-making process in the brain model that, not in terms of this is the exact network of neurons that's going to do it, but this is the kind of structure of neurons that can do that kind of thing. Then use various mathematical techniques to analyse the sorts of patterns you see. Throw in more specific, start to put the neuroscience back at that level by taking equations the neuroscientists are reasonably happy with. See what you get out of that, compare with observations, and th then go through the usual scientific iterative process, 
Maybe the observations fit, maybe they don't. Either way, you've learnt something, you build that into your model, and you try again, and you keep going round and round. And you have to get someone who knows what they're doing to do the experiments. So we're kind of in the early stages of this, and the decision-making model is very simple. It's, it's too simple to be literally true, but it captures some of the essence of the process. So this is a neuroscientist called Hugh Wilson, and he started from rivalry and then generalised it into... I mean, a topical question would be, which party do I vote for? High-level decision process. It's, it's not right down in the nuts and bolts. It, you know, political party is something with a lot of connotations in your mind. You sort of know what their policies are, you know what their track record are, but at the end of the day, you're faced with a column of, you know, Conservative, Labour, UKIP, Lib Dem, and so on. And if you're in Scotland, Scots Nationalist, because um, they're not running here. And you have to tick one of the boxes, so your brain has to choose. So Wilson's idea was you almost set up the network that way. Uh, I'll use three colours, it, it, they could be anything. It, I mean, it, it, it could be the Labour Greens and the Lib Dem, the, the Tories if you want, or it could be red, green and blue colours. So think of it as a column of possible levels of an attribute. The attribute is colour, the levels are red, green or blue, and the connections between these are inhibitory connections in the neuroscience jargon. That is, if you think of these as some sort of nerve cell or circuit of nerve cells, if one of these is active, it's firing, it's, it's, it sort of knows it's receiving a signal, it shuts the other two down, <coughs> or tries to. So this is a bit, this is, this is a winner-takes-all situation. If the red one is firing, if, if they're all sort of jiggling around, not doing much, but then the red one starts to fire a bit more uh, at a higher amplitude, then it sends signals to the other two which actually depress their activity. So whichever one seems to be in front, that is amplified and the others get shut down. So the great thing about these networks is that in normal circumstances, they will choose one thing. It may not be the right thing, but they'll choose it. They won't say, oh, it could be red, it could be green, it could be red, it could be green, or in most circumstances they don't do that. In these illusions, that's exactly what they do. So for a given attribute that can occur in several levels, we create a column with mutually inhibitory connections, and that's essentially something that can take a decision uh, but it needs some sort of input to give it a clue what it should be thinking about. However, most of the interesting experiments involve several different attributes. Colour, or sets of colours, and orientation of grid. Monkey or text in which of the six pieces of the jigsaw? So Wilson's idea is you, 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 you start with your network now and you put a column in for each type of attribute. I've shown them as all the same, but actually that's not really true. Um, so the first one may have red, green or blue colour. The second one, it could be horizontal, vertical or diagonal orientation. You don't have to have the same number of cells in a column, but for each attribute you have this little decision-making network, okay? Now, that alone will not do the job. It's just looking at attributes one at a time. This kind of network can say, decide, it can say, well, I think I'm seeing red and I think I'm seeing horizontal, but it can't say I'm, it, it doesn't actually put those together properly and it can't learn as it stands. So the final step in Wilson's setup is suppose you have one of these pattern recognizing sets of columns carved up attribute by attribute and you want to train it to recognize something. Well, what you do is you show it an image. So this particular image it's looking at 
is at level three in the first attribute, level two in the second attribute, level one in the third, level two in the fourth, level three in the fifth, okay? Whatever those are. So th th that's how that particular image pulls apart into the five attributes. So what the network does is puts excitatory connections between all of those. Everything that it that is coming from that image, you put in a set of excitatory connections. The idea behind that is if I'm seeing bits of that image, the brain is expect is learning to expect to see the other bits as well. Yes, if I see somebody riding along on a motorcycle and I can see the body and the cycle, I expect the head to be there riding along with the body. And even if it wasn't there, I'm liable to see a head to begin with unless I um, look very carefully. And certainly if it, if it was somebody who was sort of uh, disguised as somebody with no head, you would you'd start by seeing the head and think, hang on, something's wrong here. So if you show it multiple images, what you do is you repeat this construction for each of the images it sees. So you put an uh, another image might be a different collection of purple dots and you put in the corresponding collection of excitatory connections. So when it's learnt the images or if it's binocular rivalry when it's seen each of the two you do two of these and superpose the lot you now have a neural network which has learnt to recognise those two images or at least that's what should happen. Now the interesting thing is is that in fact what does happen? And in some of these networks the answer is no. It's not as simple as that. You train it on two images but the dynamics of the network resulting from the structure I've just described recognises both of those but it also responds to other images and thinks it's seeing other images. And we'll see why in a moment. Um, there's two ways of analysing this. We call them model independent and model dependent. There are certain general phenomena that occur no matter what equations you choose for your nerve cells. And then there are other things which are dependent on the precise model of nerve cells you're thinking about. The very robust phenomena are the first kind, but people often find them using the second kind because the way to see this on your computer is you put the equations for your network into some standard differential equation solver and see what it tells you. But then you have to have specific equations. But actually these are more general. Okay. So let's take a very simple example. We've got only one attribute, two levels. One column, two possibilities. Mutual inhibition says if it chooses one, it doesn't want the other one. So this could be a very simple model of rabbit or duck, necker cube, other such things. A little bit later, I will pull it apart into a slightly more complex, slightly more realistic model. But this is the simplest one, and this is actually where the subject starts, or started. OK. If we're going to... So, for the necker cube, it's those two possible percepts. <coughs> if you're going to do it the way most neuroscientists do, you say, what, what equations are we going to use? And I will briefly tell you, OK, you don't need to worry about this. That's what they look like. There are four variables, two for each cell. But the idea is there is some sort of, they call it a game function, you feed the input through this thing. At the bottom end, it's zero. That means swi it switches off. At the top end, it means one. It means the whole input gets through. And if the level at which you feed it in is somewhere in the middle, it's in between naught and one. It's in transition from off to on. OK? Partway there. So what they do is set up the equations, these are variables with particular meanings, don't worry about it. And this is the sort of, this is the important thing, the kind of solution they see for these equations as time passes, that's horizontal, 
we're looking at the rate at which the red cell is firing and the rate at which the blue cell is firing, <coughs> shown as red and blue traces. And what you effectively see is that the red cell is firing at quite a high level, high rate, and suddenly drops. And as it drops, the blue one takes over. Yeah? If we <coughs> just look at this, there is red. And then the red plunges to very low value, and blue takes over. Then red takes over, then blue, then red, then blue, then red, then blue. If you assume in your model that the decision that is made by this network is whichever of these two is firing at the greater rate, then what you're seeing is red, then blue, then red, then blue as the decisions. Necker cube facing one way, Necker cube facing the other way, back to the first way, back to the second way. And it's absolutely regular and repeating here. So the immediate prediction of this model, if you take it literally, is you switch between the two perceptions and you do so in a completely regular periodic way. Okay? Now, if you do the experiment, it's not quite like that. On average, you switch within about the same period, but it's irregular. And there's a lot of hand-waving went on early on saying, oh, uh, well, there's extra noise coming in from the rest of the brain, which sort of upsets this. This is too simple a model to capture that, but it does capture some sort of switching process. Okay. Marty did was to say, we can do a model-independent analysis of the same setup, it's symmetric. There's, there's going to be some mathematical symbols in here. Don't worry about them. The network is completely symmetric. The, the equations are exactly the same for each of the two cells. The whole way they're connected is the same. The strengths of connections, everything is the same. And there is a mathematical theorem about what's called Hopf bifurcation, which says if you have any symmetric system of this kind, there are two main ways it can oscillate periodically. And they are either that the two things oscillate in phase with each other, they do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, or they're out of phase with each other. They do the opposite things at any given time. One of them is half a period behind or ahead of the other one. Now, what we're seeing in the previous equations is the out of phase solution. First one, then the other, first one, then the other. Yeah? There out of phase with each other. In a general system, you can expect either in phase or out of phase oscillations, if you've got oscillations at all. As soon as you put the neuroscience in, with the inhibitory connection between them, if they're in phase, both of them are firing at the same time, they're both trying to shut the other one down. That's unstable, very slight variations, and one of them starts to win. The more it wins, the more it shuts the other one down. It will very quickly shut the other one down, whereas in the out of phase, they take turns being in front. The winner doesn't shut the other one down. Okay? So put the neuroscience in, and one of the model independent solutions gets ruled out. Now, this is how it works with Necker cube, or very, very simple model of a Necker cube. What about monkey text? Okay, we've got two images. A sensible network, the simplest network that could model this, is to say, look, there's two regions in the pictures. There's the white regions and the blue regions. Okay? And you can describe these pictures by saying it's monkey in one of those and text in the other one. OK. So we have two attributes. What's going on in the white bits? What's going on in the blue bits? Those are the picture. And what goes on in each of those is you either see monkey or you see text. So we have the two columns, inhibitory connections, but what is 
the visual system trained on in the experiment. What it's trained on is that monkey in one region goes with text in the other region. Monkey in the blue region goes with text in the white. Monkey in the white goes with blue in the text. So the train network gets these extra excitatory connections between the diagonal cells. And in a sense, that's the simplest network that comes close to modelling anything that's going on here. So you can ask yourself, what would the mathematics say about this kind of network? It's got more symmetry now. Each column has a top-bottom symmetry. If you flip both of them together, it looks the same. If you swap left and right, the network looks the same. So you've got two different symmetries. Okay. Well, the mathematics actually says it's rather nice. It says you, with the, with the two-cell system, they're either in phase or out of phase. Basically, the same thing happens here. They are either in phase top to bottom or out of phase top to bottom, in phase left to right or out of phase left to right, but you can combine those in four different ways. You could have all four of them doing the same thing at the same time. You could have the left one synchronised and the right one synchronised, but those two out of phase. You could have the top pair synchronised, the bottom synchronised, but those out of phase. Or you can have the diagonal pairs synchronised, sorry, the diagonal pairs, yeah, each, the two diagonal ones, but they're out of phase with each other. Okay? So I can sort of summarise that. Oh, no, we need to go back a bit. OK, so mathematically there are four patterns. But now put the neuroscience in. Vertical connections are inhibitory, diagonal ones are excitatory. What that says is vertically related cells will be out of phase with each other. Diagonally related ones you expect to be in phase with each other. But you can have, there's nothing stopping you have the diagonal pairs, which is the original images, alternating. But the one that's not ruled out, which is different, is monkey in the white region and monkey in the blue region, the top two cells synchronise with each other and winning at the same time, and then the bottom two synchronised and winning. So it goes top, bottom, top, bottom. So there's four original patterns, two are ruled out by the connections, what's left is the original diagonal pairs alternating, or the top two and the bottom two alternating. Now what's the interpretation of monkey in white and monkey in blue? It's monkey across the whole picture. Similarly text across the whole picture. So this network, which was set up to decide between the two mixed images, because of its structure, has this unexpected possibility of the two pure images occurring. And that's what's seen in experiments. Furthermore, the mathematics says, depending on the strengths of these connections, you don't see both of those solutions in a given person. They see one of them or the other one. A given experimental subject will either see the first two images or the two pure images. And that also is what's seen in experiments. So although this whole thing is very simplistic, um, it actually does the right thing in this experiment. And exactly the same network with slight differences of interpretation and with three colours down the left-hand side, but the same argument deals with the colour misbinding uh, stripe experiment. How are we doing? OK. So the idea is there are derived patterns, as Marty calls them, as well as learned patterns. You've got the two learned patterns, which are mixed, but the network has a tendency to see, perceive two others, to come up with patterns of firing that represent two different ones. So you call them derived patterns. Okay. 
And there's some others that are just like it. There's a lovely one where you, you show the left eye a target pattern and stripes, and the, and the, sorry, left eye target pattern, right eye stripes. Some subjects see the two pictures on the right. Half stripes, half target. Interestingly divided down the middle. Um, you show the left eye this thing, the right eye a hexagon, and they see arrows pointing in two different ways. Again, somehow it's the two halves of the image are getting fitted together wrong. Okay, so can we make any predictions based on this? Now it says yes, you can, and we're still waiting for someone to do the experiments. There are similar experiments which seem to fit this model. Suppose you showed three red dots to one eye and three green dots to the other eye. So that in the visual, um, in the image, they, they, when, when the binocular vision puts them together, they kind of overlap. Um, experiments have been done with four dots, or with lots of dots, but nobody did three. So we thought, well, what's, what's the setup for this? And the answer is, this is the kind of network you would set up if you take the Wilson network idea seriously. You've got three columns, which I've shown in sort of perspective now, for the three dots. Each is red or green. Within the red or within the green, you have inhibitory connections. I'm sorry the arrows are sharp, but they should be blobs. From top to bottom, you have excitatory, sorry, no, excitatory connections, the solid ones, from top to bottom, it's inhibitory. I put dotted lines instead of little blobs. And you can do the mathematics on this and say, what would that predict? And it predicts a whole pile of possibilities. But the really interesting one is the sequence shown at the bottom here. So the prediction is that people will see a sequence of six images neither of which is three red dots or three green dots. They are either two red and one green, or two green and one red. And what actually happens is, if you look from A, look at the two red dots in A, the idea is essentially that that red dot goes green, gives this, and then this green dot goes red, which gives that one, and it's as if the two red dots have moved around one place. Yep. And then this one goes green. This one stays red. That one stays green. And then that one goes red. So now it's two red dots here. So two red there, then two red there, then two red there. And the green one's doing the same thing in between. Now, we've not done the experiments yet. Well, we can't do them, but the people we know who can haven't done them yet. But here is a specific and rather surprising prediction for the four-dot experiments which people have done, similar things to this happen, but we can't call them predictions because they've already done the experiments. Okay? So you have to get ahead of the game. Here's how it actually works for the... This is your question about the pink and... Um, the network for this experiment is actually a more complicated one than the schematic one I've described. It actually turns out to behave in almost exactly the same way for mathematical reasons. So there's an algorithm you can use to set up how to do these. There's a very nice tristable illusion. People are shown to both eyes this time. This is an illusion rather than rivalry, um, but people are trained on the three images on the right, but then shown a superposition of all three. And again, it's possible to make some predictions about what should happen in that experiment. And again, there are derived patterns. You will actually see, um, the prediction is people will see the wrong combinations of colours and directions. Let's 
go back to rabbit duck. There's a, there is a prediction for rabbit duck, if you take this idea seriously, and it's slightly different from what everyone thinks. OK, suppose I decide that the attributes I'm interested in are the left half of the picture and the right half of the picture. It's either ears or beak. It's a head of some kind, but it's facing right or it's facing left. If you set up the network for that, you've got the two columns with inhibitory connections, and the brain clearly knows that if the things on the left are ears, then the head must be facing right. Otherwise, it's a rabbit that's looking into its own ears like this. Okay? So, it must be like that. If that's a beak, however, then it really should be the other way around. So, excitatory connections from beak to facing left, from ears to facing right, inhibitory connections to shut down the wrong ones. And you ask mathematically, what would that network do? And the answer is, it looks like this picture over here. So the red curves this time are the ears or beak, I think. Doesn't really matter. The blue curves are, is it facing right or left? Now, if you look at the red, you can see it's, alter it's going, it's ears, no, it's beak, no, it's ears, no, it's beak, no, it's ears, no, it's beak, because alternately they're winning. And similarly for right or left, it's facing right, no, it's facing left, it's facing right, it's facing left. But what you notice when you overlap them is that the places these things switch, the times at which they switch, are different. So it, you un the prediction is that the visual system does not say, ah, it's ears and facing right. Oh, no, it's beak and facing left. It's ears and facing right. It's beak and facing left. It's more like, oh, it's ears and facing right, except, hang on, that's actually a beak. Oh, that means it must be facing left. And there's a time lag. Yeah? So again, these models make a testable prediction. Um, haven't done the experiments again. Um, however, subjectively, if you actually look at the illusion, that seems to be sort of how it works. So maybe there's something going on here. <coughs> Let me just come. Uh, it depends. The time lag, the fact that there is a time lag is model independent. Whatever equations you put in, you would expect some time lag. But depending which equation you use, you get different lags. So if you put in particular strengths for connections or particular parameters in the dynamics of the cells, you will get different time lags. Yeah? So if, in fact, this is correct, the time lags are giving you some sort of clue as to what's going on in the visual system, to the extent that this kind of model is actually realistic. Let's go to the, finally, the spinning dancer. She's an illusion because it's a silhouette. If you actually knew which leg was which, what was in front of what, it wouldn't be an illusion anymore. There would only be one interpretation. Um, Marty would like to model this in more detail with the actual periodic motion of the dancer built in, which is a good idea. But if you just think of it picture by picture, it's like a, a more complicated version of the, the rabbit duck. You can look at different parts of the image and ask yourself yes, no questions. Which way is her head facing, forward or back? Is that the left arm or the right arm? Is the other one the left arm or the right arm? Which of those two legs is in front? Is it the vertical one or the one on a slant? Is that her left foot or the right foot? Is the other one the left foot or the right foot? And for each of those, you would have a two-cell column with inhibitory connections. 
But now we know things the brain has built into it, is learnt from childhood, if not earlier. Um, that if you see bits and pieces of a human body, there is a way they fit together. And it knows this. That's built in as um, somewhere in the system is the memory of this is. So, for example, if the answer to the top question, the third, second question down, left or right arm, if that's the left arm, then the other one's the right. She hasn't got two left arms. Okay? That means there is an excitatory connection between the answer yes to one of those and the answer no to the other one. Which leg is in front? Okay. If she's facing forwards and the slanting leg is in front, that is her right leg and the other one's her left leg. In fact, the whole thing has to fit together into a sensible human body. You can't have the bottom half of the dancer spinning one way and the top half spinning the other way. You could, if you put a pivot, you made a little model, you get exactly the same silhouette if you did that. At least you could, because there's two separate interpretations for the two halves. But we know it's not like that. And our perceptual system clearly has strongly built into it the fact that it's not like that. Well, if you model this, the kind of network you come up with has a whole pile of columns with yes-no answers, one for the head, arm one, arm two, leg, foot one, foot two. Is she spinning clockwise or is she spinning anticlockwise? This slide was prepared for the Americans. Um, and the point is that there's a whole set of them that go with the clockwise spin and the opposite set that go with the counterclockwise spin. So you get excitatory connections on the top level or on the bottom level and inhibitory connections all over the place between them. I haven't drawn them all in. And if you simulate that mathematically, well, actually, we saw that it's, uh, it's on the bottom. The green curve is what the equations give for cells 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, which together are what represents the clockwise spin. The purple signals are for the other six. And with the model set up the way it is, these things superpose almost exactly perfectly and you just switch between one set of six and the other set of six. If you look really, really closely, there are little time lags. It's like rabbit duck. The head in one orientation switches from one to the other at a very slightly different time from the rest. But what's interesting is that quite robustly, these things tend to synchronize into the two sets. And in fact, the more attributes you look at, the tighter the synchrony becomes. And that's got to be a theorem, but I don't know how to prove it. Okay? And even if you make the equations different for the square cells or the pentagonal ones or the hexagons or whatever, for the different attributes, you put different numbers into the equations for those, you still see exactly this kind of pattern again although the, the, um, the peaks will be at different heights, but they still switch pretty much in synchrony with each other. So, again, there are some possible predictions there. So, I think I've reached the point. Of, I'm, I'm fiddling here because I've lost my cursor. There it's gone. There it is. <laughs> Well, uh, absolutely. No, uh, th that was just a representative selection of... Um, you, you can focus your attention on whichever parts of the lady's body you, you wish to. Um, some will actually be more important to the brain than others. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh yes. So, this is, this is why a lot of people work with necker cubes instead of spinning dancers, <laughs> actually. Um, so, okay. Um. <coughs> you can look at the moving plaid illusion. 
a simple way to do this is say there's essentially two columns, but you're trying to decide between diamonds on the left or pairs of stripes on the right. Okay, the network you set up has, and then there's a whole perceived direction of motion. Is it moving vertically? Is it moving at this angle? Is it moving at that angle? Set that up. So we have three types of attribute, well, two types, pattern, direction of motion, but the pattern actually comes apart into two possibilities, one of which, if, it, if you see it, th there isn't a, a choice, but it could be any of those three. Um, again, there are excitatory connections. If I'm seeing diamonds, it's not moving diagonally. They're moving up or down, otherwise the diamond illusion is broken. And if you simulate that, you get traces like the one on the left. So what happens is that if you decode that picture, it actually says that the um, perceiving stripes moving like that and stripes moving the other way happens at the same time and you switch from that to something else at the same time. And what you switch to is diamonds moving that way. So one of those traces, the green one, is actually two different traces superposed for the two moving stripes. But it says they go together. And at the moment that the diamonds takes over from one of those, it takes over from the other one as well. So what the model predicts is a switch between pairs of moving stripes and rigid moving diamonds. And you keep flipping back and forth. Actually, with a specific rate model put in, with a specific rate model, it homes in on that one solution stably from almost any initial condition. Oh, if you change the rate model, you will get slightly different results. But any rate model with that network structure will give results which are similar qualitatively to what's on the left. Yeah, That's so a, oh yes. The purpose of, of this is to infer the network. No, it's not. <laughs> no. It's to examine the kind of things networks can do and to find the simplest structure that is consistent with a particular kind of behavior. We're not trying to predict the network. It's bound to be much more complicated. Um, but it is actually, there are lots of cases. I mean, the, the one place where you can almost predict the network um, top layer of the visual cortex senses um, basically what it senses is straight lines pointing in a given direction. Okay, um, there's some work by Jack Cowan and Paul Bresloff and other people on this. To do it's to do with vi visual hallucinations, in fact, and what they found there. Um, it is actually possible to image the connections in that layer of the visual cortex. And what you find is that there are little patches which are essentially direction sensors for a boundary. And they're like these columns. There's a whole stack of nerve cells and the top layer senses a boundary pointing in this direction. The next one down senses a slightly different direction. Then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one and there are inhibitory connections between them all. So as far as if I'm seeing a boundary in an image, which direction is it pointing in? I look at that wall, I see a vertical. At each vertical line, somewhere in the cortex, a little patch of cells has got the vertical direction firing and all the others shut down. Okay? But the clever thing that happens, and this is what the um, experiments actually show, is that layer of the cortex, its default view is it's seeing bits of a straight line. So if it sees a few pieces of straight line, all in roughly the same direction, it wants to kind of fill in everything else. 
And the way it does that is each of these columns, it's seeing a vertical line. So further up along the uh, cortex in the right direction is another patch of nerve cells. That should see the same direction. And this little patch actually sends signals to that one with excitatory connections to the bit of it that senses the vertical direction. So whenever a bit of your cortex sees part of a line, it kind of extrapolates that line and tells all of the patches along that direction, look for lines in this direction and give more weight to inputs that look like that. You think that means we just see straight lines? No. If there's a strong enough line coming from some other direction, it will win instead. So when I look at Marilyn Monroe there and see square, I've got a horizontal line at the top, a vertical line at the bottom. The little column that's direct detecting directions at this point is actually getting signals from stuff from both directions, which is confusing it a bit, but it's seeing a corner. So it's not surprising it's a bit confused. So the, this column type exactly this kind of network structure spread across the visual cortex in effect predicts if what you're looking if if you know that the patterns you're looking for are families of lines it actually predicts the kind of architecture that's um, that we're using in these models and that architecture is what is seen in for example the cat visual cortex probably in all mammal visual cortices um, the, that layer of the visual cortex, it's not totally regular mathematically, these are nerve cells. <laughs> but there is a very strong um, resemblance to the Wilson type networks and the learning process, detection process is similar on that level. So sometimes you can infer something about the structure. But what you would inf uh, it happened the other way around. People did the experiments, discovered what it was, and then looked at them and said, why is it like that? And then you extract these slightly simplified network models, idealized models. Okay? Um, but it, 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 you know, th there is a sense in which the brain... Um, it, it's not that each thing in my network is a single nerve cell, each connection is a real connection it's more smeared out bunches of nerve cells and smeared out connections that approximately fit the structure. And in the pictures of the cat, you see this. The, if you've got, two, you've got a patch that's detecting a particular direction, that cell doesn't just point exactly to everything along that direction. It actually fuzzes out a bit, and it's, it's a bit inaccurate, but it's concentrated along that direction, which may actually be better. Yeah. Can we not override it with experience? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, but notice that in these illusions, it's actually very hard to override it. Some of this stuff is very basic. You, it, it, people have tried to train themselves to look at the spinning dancer and say, she is always going to be going clockwise. I know she's always going to be going clockwise. And it doesn't actually work. <laughs> Um, so, I think it depends, I mean, the, the kind of, I mean, how does the brain work? Um, there's a lot, that it, and the, the visual cortex, the simplest description is layers, each of which detects certain features and then sends signals to the next layer down, telling it what it's seen, and that layer, so one layer detects lines, another layer, given a pair of lines, will detect a corner, and so on or a point where they meet. Okay, but there's also connections going back up again. So stuff further down that thinks it's seen something will eventually send connections back up. But further down still, uh, it's not, I mean, there's the, the old version of this was the grandmother cell. Yep, there's a nerve cell. It's sitting there, and the visual cortex is sending signals. It gets, sends signals to other things, depending on what it's seeing, it activates other things. Eventually, some, something fires a signal to this cell, you say, oh, that's granny. Um, now, it's not quite as simple as that, but 
there is that kind of... Now, all of that is built in by experience and by... Uh, you know, we aren't just exposed to two images. We're exposed to millions every day. But while the child was growing up, the images they saw do affect the brain structure. Um, there's classic experiment on kittens, where I if kittens do not see, I think it was basically straight lines, uh, at a certain age, then the adult cat cannot detect its whole visual system is impaired because it has not learnt to detect this particular kind of image. But all of this, mod all of this stuff, you know, the, the, the brain, you can consciously change what you're thinking about. I can, I can decide I'm, I, 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 I really want to think about what's for dinner. Right? Suddenly we're all thinking about dinner. Um, external inputs, me generating my own input. Yes, that's all in there as well. Um, but the object of the exercise is try, try to understand in a slightly schematic form certain basic processes that go on, such as deciding between certain alternatives. Um, I think um, we are now getting close to uh, thinking the break. Right. The break. <laughs> 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 Wonderful talk. Thank you so Thank much you. indeed. Wonderful. Very good indeed. Thank, Thank you. you.